Hello and welcome to today, today's webinar, Building a Winning Workplace Culture, Strategies for Leaders. I'm Ali McDonald, Senior Editor at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be moderating the event. Today's program is sponsored by HCL Software. Our speakers today are Donald Saul and Charlie Saul. Don Sol is a global expert on strategy and execution in turbulent markets. Don is a co-founder of Culture X and a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management, where he directs the Strategic Agility Project and the Culture 500. Charlie Sol is a co-founder of Culture X. He has advised the senior executive teams of dozens of multinational organizations on cultural management, strategy development, and strategy execution. Thank you for being with us today, Don and Charlie. I'll let you take it from here. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Ali. Um, so uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, what we're going to talk about today is, uh, not surprisingly, given the title of the, uh, the session, is culture. And so first of all, just to motivate our discussion a little bit before we dive into the details, the, the first thing to note is that culture matters. So there was recently a survey by, uh, done by some uh, colleagues at Wharton of CEOs and CFOs of uh, large organizations, uh, largely for-profit for organizations. And what they discovered in this survey is that culture is top of mind and very important for these executives. So uh, over 90% of the CEOs and CFOs said that uh, cult good culture increases a firm's value, okay? Not increases employee engagement, not increases job satisfaction. It may do that as well, but actually drives uh, and contributes to financial performance, operational performance, performance in the eyes of the customers. And again, it's worth noting here that this was not CHROs or chief people officers. Uh, this was... Um, CEOs and chief financial officers, the folks who are on the hook for actually delivering results. So in the, in the eyes of many executives, culture is critical for improving financial performance. A nearly uh, identical percentage said that the flip side, a toxic culture, an unhealthy culture can lead to unethical or even illegal behavior. And uh, they, and that's quite consequential as well in terms of performance for firms, because, uh, our, you know, our best estimates of uh, when a firm, uh, a publicly traded firm is caught uh, committing financial fraud, um, on average, they lose between 25 and 40 percent of their market capitalization, never to be seen again. OK, so a, a good culture can help boost performance. A bad culture uh, can um, uh, can really harm performance. And, and maybe the most interesting finding from this survey was that only about one in six of these executives, despite acknowledging and understanding the importance of culture, only about one in six of them said our culture is where it needs to be, which suggests there's, you know, for many organizations, a gap between where their culture is today and where they would like it to be. So let's, first of all, uh, you know, culture is a very broad term. People uh, have, um, you know, there are kind of many different uh, definitions and conceptualizations of culture floating around. And, and we want to anchor ours um, in the work of uh, Charles O'Reilly and Jennifer Chapman, uh, who uh, uh, a couple of decades ago really articulated a crisp definition of culture that's been widely adopted, particularly in folks uh, pursuing empirical work on culture. So the three elements of what makes a culture are, are first of all, a set of aspirational values, right? So these are things like integrity or customer centricity or diversity, broad values that firms and leaders and employees aspire to. The second component of, uh, of a culture is that those, those aspirational uh, values are translated into social norms that shape behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. So you might have a, a, a value of respect, for instance, but then a social norm that people uh, show up on time for meetings that would translate that broad value into concrete behavior. Um, but these social norms only have teeth to the extent there are either social rewards, 
for adhering to those uh, norms. So people are recognized and rewarded for, uh, for following those norms and sanctions associated with violating the norms. Okay, so this is the, this is the definition of, uh, of culture that we're going to, uh, uh, that underlies everything we're going to talk about today. So, you know, why does culture matter? It turns out culture matters for organizations for, in, in three ways. So the, the first one is the impact it has on the employee experience, okay? How you attract employees, how you retain employees, how you engage employees. Uh, so this, and, and this is probably the element of culture that most people focus in on, and rightly so. It's an important component of, um, of culture. And something we've uh, we've studied quite a bit, and we'll we'll talk about as we go through this session. Uh, so that's the first way in which culture matters. The second is culture, because it's shaping behavior of individuals within the organization, acts as a kind of operating system that can help to drive performance. And the kinds of values that might matter for employee experience. Uh, could be things like toxicity or uh, respect, integrity, the kinds of uh, uh, values that are uh, most important for organizational performance are things like innovation, agility, um, operational excellence. So it's a different set typically of values that influence the employee experience versus organizational performance, but both are important. The third way in which culture uh, has an impact on an organization, why it matters uh, for an organization, is it shapes its reputation, its external reputation. So, if you're a, um, uh, you know, if you were a chip, uh, uh, a semiconductor company a year ago, uh, as the government was, uh, you know, kind of considering the Chips Act, um, a lot of um, uh, your reputation mattered a lot for you, uh, not just in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, organizations in general want to have good reputations, uh, but quite concretely, you know, as you were going to the government as a semiconductor company for some of the funding from the CHIPS Act, your reputation as an organization was going to shape how, um, uh, how legislators viewed, uh, you know, the industry as a whole and then specific companies. So organizational reputation uh, can have quite a, uh, a large impact on performance of the organization, um, and uh, culture has quite a large uh, impact on organizational reputation. So when, as we talk about culture, we're going to be thinking about the, the all three ways that culture is influencing, uh, why it matters for an organization. So, okay, let's say culture matters. We understand how we're thinking about it, or at least how, how we're defining it. Um, and we understand the three ways uh, that culture has an impact on organizations. Then we come to a, a, a pretty profound question, which is how do you measure culture, right? A, a lot of times culture is measured as anecdote. You know, I saw this, I saw that, or wishful thinking, or um, uh, so how do you go about rigorously measuring culture? Well, one way to do it is to point to a company's core values or official corporate values. Um, and uh, in a study Charlie and I uh, did with an, a co-author a, a few years ago, what we did was looked at a sample of uh, nearly 700 large, mainly uh, US-based uh, US uh, organizations, primarily for-profit organizations, to see whether they publicized uh, core values or official corporate values. And what we found was over 80% of the organizations in our sample um, did publish uh, core values, uh, official culture statements. And uh, uh, typically um, uh, the vast majority, about 70% of these were, you know, kind of a handful, three to five of these values. So that's one way you could think about measuring culture, right? Just kind of point to the, uh, point to the poster on the wall listing your core values. Um, and these are, you know, these kind of core values are things like, you know, do what's right for the customer or behave in an ethical manner. Uh, these would be the a typical kind of, again, these are, these are at the level of, um, you know, high level values. Uh, typically these, uh, these official corporate culture statements uh, live at. So these are the kinds of values that you would expect to see. The problem with this is um, that companies don't always walk the talk, right? So these were actually the official core values of Wells Fargo the year before. Uh, they were caught perpetrating the largest uh, consumer financial fraud in, in U.S. history. So, I, I mean, that one example suggests that hmm, maybe uh, the official core values aren't really telling you everything you need to know about the culture within an organization. But, uh, you know, it's a single data point. It, it, it might uh, just just be anecdotal. Um, what what we did in a um, maybe I'll go back there for a second. 
Uh, what uh, Charlie and I and a couple of co-authors did in a separate study was we looked at uh, for those companies in our sample, and it was about 550-ish uh, companies that uh, that listed an official set of core values. We look, looked at the core values they listed and how heavily they weighed and emphasized each of those values. We took nine of the most frequently uh, listed values in this study. And then we said, okay, let's look at how employees talk about how well those companies are doing against the very values that they list as their corporate values and how heavily they weigh them. Uh, and then we correlated the companies. The, the values that the company emphasized and how heavily they emphasized them against how employees assessed how well those companies were doing against the very values that they listed. And the punchline is there's essentially no correlation. So what this chart is doing, and again, we in this analysis, we, limit our, uh, 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 we limited the values that we measured to the most nine most frequently cited values in our, in our sample. Uh, and what we see here is the correlations between what companies said they valued and how heavily they valued those things and how employees uh, assessed their organizations against those very values. And we, we looked at the correlations of those. And, and what we see is there's essentially no correlation between what companies um, uh, say they value and what empo how employees say those companies are doing against those values. So the Wells Fargo example is not an anomaly. It's quite representative of, uh, of a broader trend. And so the implication of this is when it comes to measuring culture, we can't simply rely on what the official corporate values are. Another way, common way that organizations try to measure culture is with uh, um, multiple choice questions, liquor scale questions. Uh, so uh, employees, you know, maybe in an annual engagement survey, will get a list of 40, 50, 60 questions. And they'll, uh, you know, they'll uh, respond to each of those items from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, and, and there are a couple of problems with this methodology. It's quite common, but there are... Um, um, uh, this this m m method for collecting data on culture has a couple of limitations. Probably the mo uh, the biggest limitation is that if you give um, if you give employees a long list of questions, I mean, if you give people in general a long list of questions, five point scale questions, uh, the longer the list, the more likely they are to switch to autopilot, right? So if you throw fifty or sixty questions at people, you know they'll give you lots of fours and fives or lots of ones and twos. And uh, and so what ends up happening is basically the survey is a uh, it really all kind of loads onto one factor, which is satisfied or dissatisfied. And and the discrimination you would like to see, the differentiation you would like to see between different items isn't really captured. And the flip side is you could say, well, OK, then we'll just ask a couple of questions, two, three, four questions. Great. Then there's a lower risk of autopilot. But in those cases, of course, you know, you're asking about three or four elements of culture where there might be hundreds that you'd be interested in. So that's um, uh, that's one issue. The second issue is that you don't really have any context or granular insight into what's driving those responses. So, you know, if someone says, I strongly disagree with the statement, you know, employee says, I strongly disagree with the statement, I would recommend this organization as an employer. OK, you understand that they're dissatisfied. But you don't have any under, you don't have any insight as to why they're dissatisfied. So the the methodology that Charlie and I and our, our colleagues and co-authors have adopted is based on uh, natural language processing. So our primary focus, not to say we disregard uh, Likert scale questions, these uh, you know these multiple choice questions, we, we you know we incorporate those as well. But our primary focus is on taking the free text. Uh, that of employees talking about their organization, what's working, what's not working, what their advice to management is, and analyzing that text. And, and that's, um, it turns out this, this type of unstructured uh, data, unstructured uh, textual data where employees are either describing their company or describing their uh, managers within their company is abundant in large corporations. So for, a, um, in a typical uh, really, you know, kind of Fortune 500 company, a large organization, uh, they may have between 50 and 100 HPEs worth of employee feedback. An HPE is a technical term for the amount of uh, textual data you have. It's the Harry Potter equivalent. So we basically say, okay, look at all the uh, all the pages of text of employee feedback. 
chunk those pages into no, uh, novels of the length of a Harry Potter book, and how many of those do you have? And again, in a single year, a large company can generate 50 to 100 Harry Potter equivalent no, thick novels worth of employee data. So it's abundant, it's very rich and full of insight. And, and our focus is on understanding what people talk about, what they choose to talk about, when they uh, are looking at a blank sheet of paper, which tells you something about what's salient to them, perhaps some what's important to them, and not only what they choose to talk about, but how they choose to talk about it. And we find they're very rich insights to be gleaned uh, from this, uh, this uh, textual analysis. So uh, we're going to share with, uh, so the, sorry, the, the methodology, basically what we do is we take this free text uh, and then we have an AI platform that um, classifies this free text into about 400 topics, adjusting for industry level language, company level language, uh, business jargon, misspellings, and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, pre-processing that goes into this, but um, uh, that takes this text and classifies it into about 400 different topics, roughly 200 uh, around uh, culture and employee experience, roughly 200 around leadership. Uh, and then we're able to uh, see what people talk about and then how positively and negatively they talk about it. And, uh, and then once we've structured this unstructured data, um, uh, we're able to conduct analysis. And, and the key thing about the structuring of data, which I think is sometimes lost in dis discussions of NLP, is it's absolutely critical that you uh, think deeply and are rigorous in defining and measuring the categories into which text is classified, okay? So the, the structured data, the reason we love structured data is because we know what it means, right? It's, there's a clear definition. We know how to measure it. There's agreement on how to measure it. We know what causes it in many cases, the structure and, what, and, and, and how you address it. So, you know, take the example of body mass index, for instance, um, in, in medicine, right? So we have a clear definition. Everybody agrees on how to measure it. We have uh, evidence as to what are uh, drivers or antecedents of BMI, and we have evidence of um, what are interventions to uh, help patients manage BA, uh, BMI if it's an issue for them, okay? So, so that's what we're looking for in structured data, clear definition, agreed upon measurement, uh, and the ability to link it to existing literature, either backwards, what are some of the causes of this, or forwards, how can we intervene? Uh, and that is, um, uh, we've spent a lot of time focused on that element of, um, of natural language processing, really clear definitions, clear and measurement, uh, and linkage to uh, existing academic research, uh, so that when you see the results of these analyses, you have some sense of what to do with it. So uh, Charlie's going to talk us through a couple of um, uh, analyses we've done to illustrate how you can measure culture uh, this way using Glassdoor data. And I just want to have a, a quick call out to Glassdoor. We've had a, a long and very productive research uh, partnership with Glassdoor, and they've been fantastic partners. And uh, it's, a, it's really an incredible data set. So, you know, from a standing start in 2008, Within a decade, Glassdoor was at almost 7 million reviews in the U.S. alone, okay? Uh, and the number of reviews has continued to grow since then. But, you know, Glassdoor is probably the best publicly available, high-quality, consistent-quality data for multiple employers available today, but maybe ever available in history. So it really has shown a light as the, you know, the title Glassdoor or the, you know, the name Glassdoor, a transparent door suggests, shed a light into what's going on in organizations that simply wasn't um, available uh, in the past. Now, sometimes folks, uh, you know, just dismiss Glassdoor data. This is a mistake in our assessment. Uh, and, you know, one of the most common, um, uh, you know, common critiques of Glassdoor data is that it's dominated by the rantings of disgruntled employees. So the first point I would make about that is uh, even if that were true, it wouldn't necessarily be bad because the problem is most companies, when they're doing surveys, they're only surveying their current employees. They're not surveying the employees who decided to leave. And Surveying those employees who have left provides deep insight into things that are not working in the organization. So even if this were true, it's not at all clear that it would be a bad idea. But as it turns out, it's not true. So Glassdoor ratings 
So let me step back for a minute. In, in many cases, this is an issue that the reviews in a um, in a company tend to be tend to uh, tend towards the extremes. So the only people who are motivated to uh, to um, write a Yelp review or the people who are most motivated to write a Yelp review might be people who are very satisfied with their uh, with their experience and want to share that or people who are very dissatisfied. And so in many online review platforms, you uh, you see a pattern of reviews that tends towards the extremes. In Glassdoor, in contrast, and that's what we see in the gray bars, uh, the Yelp bars uh, at the top of this chart. In Glassdoor reviews, in contrast, at least this is uh, from the sample of the Culture 500 companies, uh, what we see is a distribution that looks much closer to normal, right? Uh, and, and so it's not dominated um, by uh, negative reviews or extremely positive reviews. And the reason for this, Glassdoor uh, did something that's very, very clever, uh, is they uh, have implemented a policy they call give to get. So basically, if you want access to all the great insights available in Glassdoor, you need to write a review of your employer. And what that does is provides incentives for people to write reviews, even if they're not extremely dissatisfied or extremely satisfied. And so uh, as a result, what you get is a much more representative sample. So, um, you know, that uh, people disregard Glassdoor data at their peril. OK, so uh, what I'm going to do now is turn it over to uh, Charlie. And away you go. Thanks, Don. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so Don introduced this approach that we uh, we developed together, which is probably most famous for an MIT SMR feature called the Culture 500. I'm not sure um, how many people in the audience are uh, aware of that, but this was a, a large large scale study of corporate culture that launched a couple of years ago, uh, based on 1.3 million uh, Glassdoor reviews. And the analysis that I'm going to show you today is fairly similar to the last Culture 500. And hopefully it'll even be a sneak peek of a, a new version of the Culture 500, which fingers crossed will be uh, launching sometime soon. Uh, but yeah, so this chart is showing you how many uh, Glassdoor reviews from the USA between uh, the start of COVID and February of 2023, each company that we're gonna be looking at has in their sample. So as Don mentioned, free text is very, very abundant. So a big company, typically the largest sources of free text data they're going to have, um, at least directly related to, the, to employee feedback, are the engagement survey and 360 reviews. And that's gonna be where they're getting uh, large numbers of those Harry Potter uh, volumes of data from. But even a relatively small data set can be compared to those data sets um, of Glassdoor data it produces a very large volume of employee reviews. So for this sample that we're going to be looking at today, which is um, of the tech giants or some of the largest uh, technology companies in America, uh, this will have over 133,000 Glassdoor reviews. And even the smallest uh, company in this sample, it's a pretty impressive number of reviews. So for instance, if you take Netflix, uh, 758 reviews, that represents about 8% of their uh, global employee population. So even the, you know, the smallest number of reviews is pretty representative of the company. Uh, and you know, the punchline is this is a very uh, rich and interesting uh, way we think of analyzing data. Shout out again to Glassdoor because uh, it, it really, the more we work with this data, really the more uh, apparent it, it is how, uh, how rich and, and insightful it is. Okay, so um, I, I wanted to structure this as going through uh, some of the mo more recent articles that Donna and I have written about the, the various ways in which culture is important. Um, and as, as Don mentioned, mentioned uh, culture is important for uh, the employee experience, for uh, financial performance, and for reputation. And we'll focus a little bit more towards the end of this on the employee experience directly. Uh, but one of our most recent articles addressed more uh, of the topic of how do you uh, s produce financial value in difficult circumstances, what uh, culturally should organizations do to prepare for the, the next recession, possibly, or at least this uh, kind of uncertain financial landscape that we find ourselves in. And I'll let you read the article on your own, but the punchline is probably the most important cultural value that they can cultivate during these uncertain times is a strong culture of agility. 
and what is agility? Agility is basically um, an organization's uh, capability for uh, responding to new opportunities and nimbly, uh, uh, nimbly seizing those opportunities and responding to changes in the market. So agility is closely linked with qualities like speed, nimbleness, uh, dynamism. Um, those are you know, not quite synonyms, but uh, they are closely related to agility. So let's, in this next chart, look at how these tech giants compare big picture on, uh, on agility. And just keep in mind, just to give some sense of how complex this data is, we could show the next chart that we're gonna show for 400 different topics. There's there's a lot going on with culture, and we're only honing in, honing in um, on one aspect on this next chart. But especially for uh, for this economic landscape, this is an important part of culture to focus on. Okay. Okay. So this chart, which tech giants speak the most vocally and favorably about agility, uh, plots everyone we saw in our sample on two dimensions. So the x-axis is the percentage of employees who are mentioning agility in one of their glass store reviews. So you can see in IBM's case, this is a really, really big deal issue for them. So in Glassdoor, nearly one in four employees uh, is mentioning uh, agility and they're mentioning it overwhelmingly negatively. Uh, and then the y-axis is the percentage of mentions favorable. So you can see here that agility is generally spoken about employees when it's brought up. It's generally spoken about as kind of a pain point. It's kind of rare for employees to speak about agility net positively which makes uh, the company at the very top of this chart, Netflix, um, all the more remarkable. So in every other case, and in virtually every other case you see in the entire Culture 500 sample, uh, when employees speak about agility, they're speaking about it net negatively. In Netflix case, um, and Don might want to go into this more, he recently wrote a best-selling case study uh, about uh, Netflix. Uh, Netflix has managed to create a culture where when employees speak about agility, they're actually speaking about it as a weak uh, pro rather than a rather than a con. Uh, okay, so there's a lot going on in this chart. Um, you see various uh, companies in various states, and the color coding here is representing uh, the benchmark score. So this is basically where where are you in a good position on this chart, or are you in a not so good position on this chart? So you can see in the cases of these uh, mostly older uh, technology companies like IBM. Uh, Adobe, Intel, and Cisco, and, and Oracle. In these cases, employees are speaking very vocally. They're bringing this up, up this topic a lot, and also very unfavorably about agility. So this is a big pain point for them relative to the other tech giants. And then in a few cases like Netflix, or especially Amazon and Apple and uh, Samsung, uh, employees simply aren't bringing up this topic that much, which in this case is good news, because um, this is generally something you bring up as a pain point. So if you're not bringing it up, it means it's less of a pain point. So uh, that's good. Um, so let's focus on one of these companies that's actually bang in the middle. Let's focus on uh, Google, which is, you know, of course, a very uh, newsworthy company, especially these days. Uh, so Google, relative to the other tech giants, it's not quite where you want to be. So it's not quite Amazon or Netflix where employees are speaking about this favorably and, and maybe less frequently. Uh, and it's certainly not quite IBM or Adobe where employees are speaking about this very vocally and unfavorably. Rather, it's kind of in the middle. So when Google employees mention agility, they're speaking about it negatively. But on the other hand, they don't bring it up that much compared to the other tech giants. So. Let's see, even though it's kind of in the middle, I, I bet there's still some interesting insight you can learn about Google's culture of agility if you dive into the next level of granularity. So a cool thing about this approach that uh, Don and I developed is you can not only look at the big picture of agility or the big picture of innovation or diversity and inclusion, you can also dive deep down into granular topics and see at a granular and oftentimes a more actionable level uh, what is going on behind this big picture score. So that's what we're going to see on the next chart. So here we're looking at a subset of the uh, dozens of components of agility that we measure and tracking Google's performance on all of them, again, compared to the other tech giants. So uh, the, the way to look at this axis is it's, uh, it's basically standard deviations of is this where you want to be on a chart that looks like the last chart or is it not where you want to be? Uh, it's a benchmark score expressed in standard deviations. And you can see that Google actually does a very good job of uh, change readiness, which is um, 
it, it can mean different things. I'd, I'd have to look more into this data to see what it means in Google's case um, specifically. But generally, change readiness is your ability to adopt to adopt a change, uh, to make frequent um, uh, reorganizations in the organization, for instance. Uh, and it's um, more about kind of uh, you know uh, seizing these new uh, market opportunities as as they arrive. Um, so that's one relative strengths of Google's. But then you can see at the bottom uh, part of this chart, there are a few areas where Google is uh, significantly below the benchmark, more than a standard deviation below. So in terms of entrepreneurialism, big company feel. So does does this company kind of feel like a small, nimble startup or does it feel like a, you know, a, a larger hooli if, if anyone's seen uh, Silicon Valley? And related to that, uh, unbureaucratic, which is our measure of uh, bureaucracy. Um, so this is kind of an interesting insight because a lot of people, when they think of Google, they still have that image of Google that was very prevalent maybe 20 years ago when it was this really, you know, dynamic company that was, you know, this uh, yeah nimble startup taking on the world, changing everything. Um, and you wouldn't associate that that kind of image with things like uh, bu bureaucracy or having this really big company, uh, giant company feel. But actually, in the in the view of employees. That is kind of what Google has become in 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 some senses. So this this culture of agility that you um, would really strongly associate with Google, kind of during the earlier days, has to a large extent kind of been eroded, at least in the eyes of their employees. So if you look at a uh, bureaucracy, for instance, you can uh, recreate this chart again, looking at the different tech giants, and you can see that Google actually in this sample. <laughs> Um, so again, when uh, when employees speak about bureaucracy, they're almost always bringing it up as a pain point. It's very unusual for them to bring it up as uh, a thing that's actually good about the company to say specifically, uh, there's no bureaucracy here. I love how there's no bureaucracy. Um, and that makes Netflix, again, all the more remarkable because this is actually something they speak about net positively. But if you look at all the other companies besides Netflix, they, they follow a more regular pattern. Um, and you can see that uh, the, 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 the company uh, within tech giants where bureaucracy is the most pronounced pain point is by far IBM, which, you know, probably makes sense. I mean, they're, they're you know, an older company um, with a lot of processes. But the second most in this sample is actually uh, Google, even more so than Intel or Cisco or uh, Adobe, which is um, kind of interesting. So as Google tries to navigate this, uh, you know, this uh, very quickly changing market with it, with the introduction of open AI and respond to all these new uh, challenges and opportunities, uh, there, there are going to be a lot of factors that go into whether or not they're successful, um, not all of them cultural by any means. But in terms of their culture, one of the, the bottlenecks to their success might just be this chart that you're seeing now, which is how bureaucratic Google is um, compared to their competitors. Okay, so that's, as I mentioned, these are, we've seen charts for two of the topics and we, we measure hundreds of the topics. Culture is very, very complex and different things can matter in different contexts. So from these two charts, which have shown Google, unfortunately, and I apologize to Google, in, in somewhat of a negative light, um, you might be thinking, wow, well, maybe Google's actually not that great of a place to work. But that's a very different thing. So there, there are two things going on. One is a, a culture of performance, which at least with regards to agility, Google's kind of in the middle of the road of has challenges with bureaucracy. And the other is a culture of uh, employee experience. So the question we're going to ask on the next chart, which much more with a much more simple methodology is, is Google a, a good place to work for, for software developers? So what this chart is showing, very simple chart, is just showing the overall Glassdoor rating uh, from the start of COVID uh, to uh, basically the present day for software developers within the tech giants. And you can see that actually on the very top of the list is Google. They're kind of off the charts. So they have a rating of 4.51 out of five. Very, very impressive rating. And they, these are, you know, other companies too. It's, it's a software developers traditionally, and that's changing now, but traditionally they've been treated very well by their employers, particularly large employers. Um, so it's, uh, it's very impressive for Google to be at the top of this list. So the question now that we're going to turn to is moving away from uh, a culture for uh, driving financial performance and more towards a culture for the employee experience. What matters the most to employees? 
So we can answer this with a chart that uh, comes in very handy. It's, it's a very interesting chart. I, I hope we're going to be able to use it for the next Culture 500. Um, and certainly individual organizations find this chart helpful. So what this chart is doing, I'll just explain it here so that it, it makes sense when I show it. On the y-axis is the measure of performance that we've seen before. So this is the benchmark score of Google relative to the other tech giants expressed in standard deviations. So how well is each topic going relative to the other tech giants? And then on the x-axis is a new um, uh, is is a new measure that we're going to uh, introduce, uh, which we call importance. And what this is doing, it it, it employs uh, a methodology called chap drivers. Uh, which was actually cited for the Nobel Prize uh, about a decade ago. And what Chap Drivers does is it does a very good job of taking hundreds of different features. So in this case, all the different free text topics that we're looking at. So anything from uh, bureaucracy to cross-unit collaboration uh, to promotions to uh, inclusion, hundreds of different topics. And it takes an outcome. So in this case, the outcome that we're looking at is the overall rating. And what Chap Drivers does a world class job of is determine which of those free text topics uh, that is cited has the most powerful uh, driving uh, driving influence on that outcome. What percentage of the total variance of that outcome uh, does each topic explain? OK, so that's the X axis. And now I'll actually show the chart for what this looks like for a real company. But it's very interesting because different companies have uh, very different um, charts like this. And you can tell a lot by a company by looking at how this chart looks for, for their employees. OK, so when you do this exercise for Google, you can see that on the left, there are a bunch of topics that have, you know, drive a relatively small percentage of the overall Glassdoor rating. So, you know, benefits is driving, you know, about 2%. Um, creativity matters, coding software matters. So this is a population of, uh, of uh, uh, software engineers, so that's going to matter. Uh, things like voice of the employee, which is the extent to which employees feel like they're, uh, they're being listened to, like their voice is heard. Um, this matters. And there's a lot of variance that you see on the y-axis. So, for instance, food perks, we've all, again, we, based on what we know about Google from, you know, 20 years of them being in the pop culture, we know that they have very good food perks, right? So we know that they have, you know, gourmet sushi and all this stuff. And it turns out this actually really makes the difference for employees. So not only are they two standard deviations above the average for tech giants, um, this actually uh, drives their overall rating to a fairly large extent. It, it, it explains about 4% of the variance of this model, which is pretty good. I mean, it's, it's, it's bigger than a lot of other um, important things. But there are two topics on the far right that really jump out as the most important that are driving up Google's rating, which, as we know, is very high um, to the largest extent. And those are um, management and Toxic5. And I'll talk about Toxic5 in a little bit. But um, management is very important. So this is a, so we have more granular ways of looking at what level of management they're talking about. Um, but management is uh, basically general measures of management that can range anywhere from uh, the top team to your immediate supervisor. But generally, these mentions are focused on kind of middle management. Uh, and here at Google, this is going off the charts good. So this is 1.5 uh, standards of deviation uh, better than um, what we see uh, before. Um, OK, so I'll just move on. And then one the cool thing you can do, hopefully we'll see this in the next Culture 500, is for each of these topics, you can see uh, what employees speak about favorably when they speak favorably about management. So you can learn what the real strengths of this are. Google, um, here it appears to be things like empowerment, uh, learning and development, supportive, a, a lot of good stuff uh, going on at Google. And uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to speed this along a little bit because I do want to get to Q&A. But a couple of other interesting things to note out to uh, point out here. Um, Toxic5 is this other huge driving um, uh, force behind the rating at Google. And it's, again, it's something Google does well. So I, I, I don't mean to uh, be mean to Google. Google does a lot of things really well. One of them is they have a rel uh, quite a healthy um, uh, corporate culture in terms of toxicity, um, half a standard deviation above the benchmark. And you can see that toxicity, uh, we call it the Toxic5 toxicity 
um, we call toxicity the toxic five because it consists of um, five dimensions of toxicity that our research identified as, as being salient. Uh, so disrespectful behavior, non-inclusive behavior, abusive behavior, cutthroat competition, and unethical behavior. And what we can see here is that although compensation does matter, you can see that's accounting for about 7% of the variance. Toxic five accounts for double of that. And this is consistent with what we see in various research. Um, so we, we took a, a different approach. I won't go into our exact methodology for this article. Um, but what we found here, examining the causes of the great uh, of, of, uh, of attrition during the first year of the great resignation, is that toxic five is the single most powerful predictor of attrition um, during this time period by far, by far. So toxic culture punchline really matters. Of all the different to topics, um, that we talk, that we measure, um, at least from an employee experience perspective, and also largely from a reputational perspective, um, Toxic Five is really the the single one maybe to, uh, to to look out for. And what else is interesting about Toxic Five? So, what else is interesting about Toxic Five is not only is it the uh, the most important topic a, a lot of the time for the employee experience and for reputation. Uh, toxic culture is also the one area where there is the biggest gap between male perceptions of the culture and female perceptions of the culture. And the punchline of this uh, latest body of research that we're doing is that uh, females are 41% uh, more likely to negatively cite, to negatively report toxic culture on Glassdoor than males. So it's this, this huge discrepancy that you really don't see measuring um, virtually any other topic. And um, I won't go too much into this chart, but you can see when you look at the software developer uh, population, particularly, um, specifically, uh, and it, you look at the areas at the bottom where females are much more likely to be critical. So I'm only showing the the areas where the where there, there are the biggest gaps between how men and women speak about the culture. Um, all the areas where females are more critical are related to toxicity. So favoritism, component of toxicity, abusive leaders, component of toxicity, leaders promote DEI, diversity and inclusion, very important toxicity, racial equity, gender and equity. This is all related to toxicity and it's very consistent with a lot of research that we see, not only looking at software developers, but looking at uh, employees all over America and in fact, all over uh, the world. So you can see here, what what is the toxic culture gender gap, which is a term we're hoping uh, picks up traction because we think it's very important um, within this American software engineer population uh, during this time period, uh, it's 1.2x. So that's actually pretty big. Women are 1.2x more likely to negatively cite toxicity to, than men within this population of American software engineers. And the bad news is, well, that's bad news alone. The even worse news is this is relatively good compared to most other job segments. So this would actually be on the lower end. Again, the average is 1.41x. So 1.2x is a lot lower. And you see some occupations like chef, civil engineer, electrical engineer, technical manager, where the gap is 1.7x or higher. So uh, that's a brief introduction to, uh, to, to, to agility, to, um, uh, to the toxic five, and to the toxic culture gender gap. So now I'll turn it back over to Allie for uh, some Q&A. Thank you, Charlie. That was great. Perfect timing. <laughs> you guys got through so much. So uh, we have a lot of questions from our audience and um, we'll now move into our Q&A. If you'd like to ask Don and Charlie a question, you can still do so by putting it into the Q&A module in the engagement panel. Um, so that was great. And I've worked with you both on culture content for a long time. So this is exciting for me to see so much of your work kind of all in one place. Um, and we got a lot of questions from our audience. And I will say this is one of the most intelligent sounding audiences I've ever seen on a webinar. There were people using citations for research and citing Ed Shine and uh, a lot of great questions here. So let's dive in. Um, one of them, or a couple actually, came out of some of the talk that you were um, doing earlier in the presentation, Don, about sort of the relationship between what culture is purported to be or what leaders think their culture is versus what is felt on the ground by employees. So um, I had a couple questions that kind of got at this, but there was a recent Gallup poll showing that only 21% of employees feel connected to their organization's culture. So 
do you find that there is a stronger correlation when employees are involved in developing values and behaviors and when there's more direct input from employees up into shaping culture than when culture comes top down? Um, yeah, yeah, of course, there, um, uh, you know, that uh, employees are, so actually, let me step back. So remember, when we're looking at culture, we're thinking about three things, right? The impact on the employee, the impact on performance, and the impact on external reputation. So the first thing to note is that uh, when leaders are trying to shape, and they don't define, and they don't create, and they can't dictate culture, but shape culture, uh, employee engagement is not the only consideration. And one of the most important trade-offs we see, for instance, in the data is that uh, in many organizations, um, uh, high, uh, scoring high in agility is associated with uh, higher workload, higher probability of burnout, worse work-life balance. So the first thing I just want to note is that it's not the case that organizations do or necessarily should optimize culture for employees alone. And, 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 that, and it, it entails some hard trade-offs uh, is the first point. The second point is that, yes, it, of, of course, employees are more likely to be involved in um, uh, more engaged with culture if they're more involved in, in um, shaping it. And, but that doesn't necessarily have to happen at the values level. Um, it oftentimes happens more directly at the uh, uh, level of social norms. Um, so, for instance, um, uh, there was a, uh, a very nice uh, uh, program at the Veterans uh, Administration Hospitals uh, implemented called the CREW uh, uh, Initiative. Uh, and basically, was, it was launched in 2005 designed to address widespread disrespect within the Veterans uh, Administration Hospitals. It was very... Um, uh, it was very nice about this intervention, which, by the way, has been documented. Uh, the impact has been documented in careful studies, both inside the Veterans Administration and outside the Veterans Administration, where it's been implemented. And the important thing here is that the value of respect was kind of decided at the top, although based on input from the employees that, you know, we're just being, you know, we feel like we're not being treated respectfully. And that that was a real issue. So that was an uh, um, an example of sh shaping the choice of focal value. Uh, uh, based on input from employees. Uh, so that was good. But what's really interesting there is that in this program, in intact work teams, typically 10 to 15 employees, would uh, meet weekly uh, for a six-month period, starting with data, brainstorming ideas of what would be the social norms that would be appropriate to uh, embody respect in their context. So if you have, uh, you know, a rural hospital in Alabama, the norms of, of civility and respect might look different from a, a, a hospital in New York City, for instance, or across different, you know, functions or specialties. Uh, and so the teams where they really focus their attention is everybody said, yeah, respect matters. That's an overarching value. But where we're going to focus our attention at the employee level is defining what respect means in and translating into specific uh, and tailored um, social norms for our, our work team. And, and that's where you see um, some really strong uh, uh, impact from employee involvement. That's great. And the example Don is mentioning about the, the crew team um, and those hospital systems, that's actually in one of the articles in the handout section. So um, the audience can get more information there. Um, we also had questions coming up for, in terms of economic impacts happening in the market right now, and especially, you know, the tech tech industry was a, a feature uh, throughout this presentation, and we're seeing lots of layoffs. So any way you cut it, layoffs are morale killers, but they're also, you know, an important lever for companies in times of economic turbulence. So given um, that they won't go away, lay off three orgs, uh, but leaders who are, you know, culture conscious want to do best by the employees still in the company. How do leadership teams keep culture in the foreground when approaching some of these more difficult economic situations? Yeah, I, so... 
again, the first thing we come back to this unfortunate reality that, you know, oftentimes people don't acknowledge or don't want to acknowledge, which is there are trade-offs in culture, you know, as there are trade, I mean, anybody who tells you you can have it all, uh, it, you know, that's inconsistent with a lot of what we know about life. Uh, and, and so, um, unfortunately, there are situations where leaders, uh, you know, and, and partly it doesn't reflect well on them that they allowed uh, um, their um, their staffs to get beyond uh, the levels that they probably should have gone to in the past. So that's, um, you know, it really kind of comes back to poor leadership or suboptimal leadership in terms of managing staffing in the, in the, in the boom times. Um, but then, you know, so again, that's the first thing to note. Uh, in terms of, ac interestingly, um, layoffs or any, when it, people leaving a company is as powerful a way or an organization is as powerful a way to manage culture as people joining an organization in the following sense, that if you're selecting in employees based on the align, their alignment uh, with the kind of uh, values and social norms that you're looking for, that can build uh, the culture. If you promote those employees to management positions who kind of embody uh, the culture, the values and norms uh, that you're trying to, that you aspire to, that can reinforce the culture. The other thing is when employees leave, whether it's voluntarily or involuntarily, um, if you're focused on um, separating people who you think, you know, really they, they aren't embodying the values of, uh, and the, the social norms that we want. That can be a mechanism to actually strengthen your culture. Um, and so it's, um, um, unfortunately, most companies don't do it that way. It tends to be like last in, first out, or uh, whoever's least politically connected gets laid off. Uh, you know, they don't think about culture when they're thinking about subtraction. There are a whole other set of issues about just handling the process uh, so that you respect people's dignity. And that, that's, a, a you know, a, a, another uh, issue for and, and a longer discussion. But Right, exactly. Um what you were getting into at the end, Charlie, with the recent, the most recent article you both published was on the toxic culture gender gap. And that was a really uh, interesting dive into what I've found really interesting in your work on toxicity is the work of subcultures within organizations and how uh, the experience of culture um, can be very negative for pockets of your organization. And even if those are small pockets, that can have sometimes an outsized impact. So I'd love for your perspective on what subcultures mean in organizations and measuring them and just how can leaders be more aware of their impact? Yeah, well, I think it, it, it really comes back to having a robust listening strategy that gives you uh, the capability to to listen to all these different segments, which can be defined a variety of ways. I mean, based on gender is, is sometimes very relevant, uh, based on geography, based on function, based on tenure is actually one of the, one of the most interesting dynamics that we find. So we find in, in a, a lot of the time that there's this um, big... Uh, we call it the stuck in the middle effect. So there's this really big new employee bump where employees are fresh faced and very satisfied with the company. And then they gradually lose some of those perks of being new, but they don't yet have the perks of being uh, senior at the end. So senior employees tend to be uh, in most organizations relatively uh, highly satisfied. But then there's this group in the middle, um, uh, the, the middle tenure bands uh, that don't uh, experience the benefits of either seniority or uh, being new to the company. So uh, that's to say that a tenure band can be another um, segment or, or subculture uh, criteria that you want to consider. Um, but I think Don's point about um, the way this is traditionally measured um, is the main practical reason why most leaders aren't aware of where these problematic subcultures are and how, uh, how they tend to speak about the employee experience. Because for this simple kind of boring, technical sounding reason of autopilot, uh, it's the case that most, if you, if you launch a large engagement survey, 
most of the answers are going to feel pretty similar to most of the other answers for the simple reason that if you're answering 50 or 60 different questions, you're barely paying attention to, the, to, to, to each question and you're just going through and doing five and fours for, uh, for everyone. So I think uh, th the main reason why there's less knowledge about subculture than there should be is because the way that listening works in virtually every big company is um, not ideal. Right. And we got questions about that, too. And I, I think just having worked with you both on your work, um, it's just reinforcing that idea that getting pulses, getting open, you know, open answers, moving away from sort of the, the rote, I'm going to robotically answer this, this five point scale seems so important. Um, do you think that that's a difficult change for companies to go into giving giving more getting more qualitative data from employees. I, I imagine that it's it's sort of hard to manage that scale to have suddenly just getting more information like that. Yes, I I, I do, but I I think it's manageable. I mean, I, I think one of one of the most interesting developments we're seeing in business big picture over the last five years maybe is um the growth of people analytics as if within the mm -hmm. organization and they're the ones who are going to be largely responsible for these you know ai or relatively sophisticated ways of making sense of this richer but less structured data uh so i'm optimistic that as as those functions continue to mature we'll we'll start to see better solutions for this, which is really going to result in the whole landscape looking a lot rosier. Because once you can actually install these effective listening tools and understand what's going on with nuance and richness in all these various parts of your organization, it becomes easier not just to develop the appropriate values, as we heard a couple of questions ago, but it becomes much easier to, to respond to a whole variety of issues that are are salient to employees that simply weren't on your radar before you had these uh, these capabilities. That's a great point. Um, and we, we have one, time for only one more question, which is unfortunate because there were so many good questions. We could probably have another hour of Q&A here, but a lot of people did bring up um, you know, the elephant in the room of, you know, post COVID work life and hybrid work. And a lot of work seems to have sped up, you know, in the order of decades over the course of the last three years. How, what you're talking to leaders all the time, you're talking to companies. Um, what is your advice for leaders in terms of tackling some of the challenges of the in person and remote culture that is work life now for many knowledge workers? Yeah, I, I think a couple of things. First thing to note, uh, uh, Nick Bloom's work at Stanford is absolutely phenomenal uh, in terms of just uh, documenting and helping us to understand what's happening with remote work, hybrid work, and uh, and on-site work. And I think where Nick is coming out, Nick and his colleagues in, in their data collection effort, is that you know, you're going to have a, a chunk of employees who are always going to be on-site. 40, 50 percent. It will obviously vary by industry and healthcare and, uh, you know, retail, it's going to be much higher. Maybe 10 percent uh, will be fully remote. And then in the middle, you'll have hybrid. So the first thing to note is that how um, the experiences of those employees are going to be very different. Uh, one, because of the nature of the work. Two, because of the nature of the people who are doing that kind of work. So the folks who are fully remote are oftentimes going to be uh, very technical people, very high skilled people who have intermediaries like TopTal for matching. Uh, so they're going to have a lot of job opportunities. You know, the retail, you know, a retail or fast food worker, in contrast, may have fewer job opportunities. If they're a nurse, there may be a local monopsony in terms of employers, and so not much choice. So the the experiences of the people in these three different categories is going to be different, both because of the experience and because of the populations who uh, find themselves in these in these different work modalities. So that's the first point. The, so the 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 one that I th we find most or organizations are most focused in on, perhaps rightly, perhaps wrongly, is around the hybrid workers. And I think the punchline there is, if you're trying to build and maintain a healthy culture or shift your culture to something more healthy, if you used to have five days a week 
to interact, you know, where employees were interacting with one another and either reinforcing or undermining the culture, you now have three days a week, right? So I, I think that to, to get that done. And so the, the punchline there is uh, it really, um, it, uh, organizations and leaders, if anything, need to be more mindful and focused on making and framing that time in the office as, among other things, an opportunity to kind of uh, shape the culture that you want and the social norms that you want. Uh, you can't afford to be sloppy if you only have employees in uh, uh, in the office three days a week. I mean, you, frankly, you can't afford to be sloppy if you have them in the office five days a week, but it's even more pronounced with a, a shorter work week. That's great advice. Thank you both so much for your time and for sharing these insights. Um, thank you to our audience for asking such great questions. Thank you again to our sponsor, sponsor HCL Software. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Ali.